Now, speaking of what the media says, you have uh, stopped giving interviews for the last couple of years. Yes, I should have start, stopped uh, many years before that, actually. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> Uh, I see no correlation between what I say and what the media reports. And of course, there's a question about how much Democrats should use the issue of race, perhaps in a general election. Is the president a racist? There's some new numbers there. Yeah, there are some new numbers. So Quinnipiac University polled it last week. And what we basically see, a, ma a majority of Americans, a majority of voters believe that the president of the United States is racist. That, to me, is unbelievable. In and of itself. In and of itself, it's unbelievable. But I think what's also unbelievable is, despite all the press that we've seen recently, that number's basically a move from where it was last year, right? when it was 49%. So it doesn't seem to me that, you know, people basically are in their corner about Donald Trump. But I think what's even more interesting than the overall numbers is take a look at the numbers broken down by race. And what you see is essentially that African-Americans overwhelmingly, 80% of them believe that the president of the United States is racist. But among whites and Hispanics, you have a far closer to an even race going on. And I think oftentimes, you know, we group together non-white voters into one block. But what we basically see here is Hispanics are looking a lot more like whites when it comes to whether they consider the president racist or not. I did a voter panel yesterday with Michigan voters, and there was a woman there who um, made no uh, bones about calling the president racist. She likened him to George Wallace. We've heard this analogy before, and you looked at the numbers. You know, I was able to type into my computer, go to the Roper Center and see that. In fact, there was a poll in 1968 that asked, whether or not you thought that George Wallace was racist. Oh, my goodness. And what you basically see here oh my is goodness. a higher percentage of voters right now actually think that Donald Trump is racist than thought George Wallace, although the spread, there was much more of undecided. The spread is basically the same. So those comparisons to me seem quite apt, at least in terms of the public opinion of the two men. I've never seen that. That's stunning to me. And again, in and of itself, the idea that a majority of Americans think the president is a racist is noteworthy. So the president's approval rating, Harry. Right, and I think, you know, we've saying, oh, is the pre president playing 3D chess? Is he playing 20-dimensional chess? What we see is that, in fact, the president's approval rating has not moved since the end of last month. It's 43%. It's not like he's being able to use these attacks and go and actually grab more voters. Voters are very much settled on who, what they think of the president, and overwhelmingly, a majority do not like him. And let's get back to the primary criticism uh, of your book made by a, a writer I really respect, William Raspberry, syndicated columnist. He says that you make these points, but you don't say what we should do. What we should first of all do is understand what does and does not work. I don't consider myself to be a policymaker, despite what the media may try to say. I consider myself to be someone who tries to supply facts so that those who do make policy will know what they're talking about, as they usually do not. Now, speaking of what the media says, you have uh, stopped giving interviews for the last couple of years. Yes, I should have start, stopped uh, many years <laughs> before that, actually. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> uh, I see no correlation between what I say and what the media reports. Uh, one of the most uh, hideous things that I've seen reported in, uh, was on the CBS Morning News where they said, or suggested, that I uh, was a believer in the uh, theory of genetic inferiority of blacks. Now, I have been arguing against that theory for more than 10 years, and I don't know how many books, how many articles, and how many lectures. This was so well known that British television tried to arrange a debate between Arthur Jensen and me. I don't know why the word got to London, but it never got to Washington. So you have been wary, uh, to say the least, of the media. I think that's an understatement. Coming into this, if she had been elected president after Russia had taken this wild swing at her in her presidential election campaign, I mean, imagine what that would have meant in terms of the coin of power that a U.S., an administration, a new U.S. president could direct Russia's way. But yet they still saw it as worth it. And I think the reason it was still worth it for them is because they were so desperate. And the reason they were so desperate is because their economy is such a disaster. And the specific way in which their economy is a disaster is about oil and gas. And it's worth it to them almost to try anything to get out from the U.S. sanctions that have precluded Western oil majors from helping them drill what they need to drill to keep their economy going. I always say uh, the uh, economy of Texas is larger than the economy. 
of Russia. Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, Russia is 150 million people, gigantic country. Their economy is smaller than Texas, smaller than Italy, smaller than South Korea. They've got one industry, and that was a Putin decision because he really wanted to use oil and gas as a weapon. But it's not like we're naming oil company CEOs to Secretary of State or mm -mm. No, definitely. Something I heard you say in an interview <laughs> late recently, in effect, that you still have not gotten over them. No, I mean, Rex Tillerson, I mean, Rex Tillerson is an amazing character. But he did a half trillion dollar oil deal with <laughs> Russia that was put on ice because of U.S. foreign policy. Putin gave him a medal. Putin elected the next U.S. president, arguably. And then even though Donald Trump and Rex Tillerson had never met each other and didn't get along, all of a sudden Rex Tillerson ended up being the next guy in charge of U.S. policy. It's a really, really weird thing that we still don't actually have a great explanation for, even as, as good as I got to know Rex Tillerson over the course of writing this. Many among the intelligentsia create their own reality, whether deliberately or not, by filtering out information contrary to their conception of how the world is or ought to be. Some have gone further. J.A. Schumpeter said that the first thing a man will do for his ideals is lie. It is not necessary to lie, however, in order to deceive, when filtering will accomplish the same purpose. This can take the form of reporting selective and atypical samples, suppressing some facts altogether, or filtering out the inconvenient meanings or connotations of words. Filtering the sample of information available to the public can take many forms. For example, Bennett Cerf, the founder of Random House Publishers, at one time during the Second World War suggested that books critical of the Soviet Union be withdrawn from circulation. When the American economy was recovering from a recession in 1983 and unemployment was down in 45 out of the 50 states, ABC News simply chose to feature a report on one of the five states where that was not so, or, as they put it, where unemployment is most severe, as if these states were just more severe examples of a more general condition, when in fact they were very atypical. Filtering can also take the form of incessantly reporting data showing blacks or other non-white groups as being worse off than whites, in income, rejection of mortgage loan applications, or layoffs during economic downturns, and not reporting that whites are in all these same respects worse off than another non-white group, Asian Americans. Even when data are available for all these groups, Asian Americans tend to be filtered out in news stories that are de facto editorials, whose clear thrust is that white racism is the reason for the lower incomes or lower occupational status or other misfortunes of non-white groups. Including Asian Americans in these comparisons would not only introduce a discordant note, it would raise the possibility that these various groups differ in their own behavior or performances, contrary to implicit assumptions, and that such differences are reflected in the outcomes being studied. In short, the performance of Asian Americans has implications going far beyond Asian Americans themselves, for it is a threat to a whole vision of American society in which many have a large stake, ideologically and sometimes politically and economically. Homelessness is another area where much of the media filters what kind of reality gets through to their audience. During his time at CBS News, Bernard Goldberg noticed the difference between what he saw on the street and what was being broadcast on television. In the 1980s, I started noticing that the homeless people we showed on the news didn't look very much like the homeless people I was tripping over on the sidewalk. The ones on the sidewalk, by and large, were winos or drug addicts or schizophrenics, they mumbled crazy things or gave you the evil eye when they put paper coffee cups in your face and asked for money. But the ones we like to show on television were different. They looked as if they came from your neighborhood and mine. They looked like us. And the message from TV news was that they didn't just look like us, they were like us. On NBC, Tom Brokaw said that the homeless are people you know. If the homeless tend to be sanitized in television news... Businessmen tend to be demonized in movies and television dramas, as another study found. Only 37% of the fictional entrepreneurs played positive roles, and the proportion of bad guy businessmen was almost double that of all other occupations. What's more, they were really nasty, committing 40% of the murders and 44% of the vice crimes. Only 8% of primetime criminals were black.